This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So recently I decided to start doing some more organic chemistry on my channel and for this video figured that it's time to join the Smell Chemistry Club. That's because apart from white powders, stars and dyes, a big part of organic chemistry are compounds with interesting scents and for as long as I can remember I wanted to make some. The problem with this however is that there are like hundreds of them each having a unique smell and this made me quite unsure of what I wanted to make. You see, literally everything you can smell is based on some most often carbon containing or in other words organic molecules. These molecules are often quite small since they need to evaporate fast enough so that we can smell them but that in no way takes from their diversity and there is a whole spectrum of smelly compounds ranging from the scent of flowers to the stink of sewage. Apart from the obviously good and bad smells, there is a lot of stuff that just smells interesting and for a long time I was actively looking for a smelly molecule I could synthesize among the things I use every day. At first nothing really struck me as interesting enough, but one day when eating some popcorn I had a moment of enlightenment. I realized that I have never thought much about the smell of butter flavored microwave popcorn, which I am really familiar with because of consuming more than reasonable amounts of this salty treat. You see, this so called butter flavoring doesn't smell like butter at all, at least to me, and my mind has just been taught to associate it with this yummy popcorn. When I realized that this wasn't just a butter extract, I decided to dig deeper and find out what this mysterious flavor is and after spending like 3 hours on the internet I now have a pretty good idea. This scent has actually way more to it than just being some random butter imitator and first of all the molecule that's responsible for it is this little goober called diacetyl. It's an incredibly small molecule featuring a 4 carbon chain with those two cute oxygen atoms glued to it. Even for a scent, this molecule is really unusual and upon learning about its structure I was quite surprised that such a random, useless looking chemical is a famous butter flavoring. What's even more interesting about it is that many people died from exposure to it since when you breathe its vapors, over time they basically turn your lungs into cardboard. Because of this, its use has been phased out in many parts of the world, but where I live, it fortunately or not, is still used to flavor things like popcorn. Based on all this cool information, I decided that this is exactly what I want to make, however this was the easy part since in the articles about it I couldn't find any accessible method of making it. I was really worried that this project would be nipped in the bud by the lack of synthesis information, but fortunately when one day reading through this gigantic copy of a 1954 Polish chemistry book I somehow stumbled upon the exact procedure I needed. What's even more fortunate is that it seemed quite straightforward and started from an easily accessible paint stripper chemical, all of which made me really hyped about making some deadly chemical butter. Before beginning the synthesis however, I really want to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an advanced all-in-one website creation platform that allows entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online, using it you can easily create incredible websites whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand and use them to promote your business or sell anything. Squarespace provides you with useful tools like their new design intelligence which combines two decades of industry leading expertise with cutting edge AI technology to unlock your strongest creative potential and make your website tailored to your unique needs which is really amazing if you ask me. Additionally, Squarespace gives you access to powerful features like their email campaigns that are everything you need to engage your subscribers and drive sales, which combined with Squarespace's new option for creating and selling your own online courses can expand your business like never before. For a free trial, head to squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, check out squarespace.com slash amateurchemistry to save 10% off your first purchase. 
Anyway, according to my ancient book, making some butter flavoring is quite simple, at least in terms of ingredients, and sticking of those, I first need something to function as a skeleton I can build my butter fragrance on. This mystery chemical is something called methyl ethyl ketone, or MEC for short, it's basically just a fancy version of acetone, since in terms of chemical structure, it differs only by a single carbon atom, and is nearly identical to the final diacetyl. It is sometimes used as paint stripper and has surprisingly many chemical applications. To make it into my butter flavoring, all I have to do is just add a single oxygen atom onto its carbon chain, which on paper looks simple, but as these things often go, in reality it is actually quite complicated. Fortunately, someone in 1954 already figured it out, so I can just rip off their hard work, and to prepare for the first reaction in the synthesis, apart from methyl ethyl ketone, I have to use something called sodium nitrite. It's a lesser known cousin of the more popular chemical sodium nitrate and is often used as a meat preservative that gives it an unnatural pink color and can make your blood look like some nice hot chocolate. Anyway, to start the reaction, I mounted this Freeneck round bottom flask in a hot plate with stirring. I then poured in 40 grams of methyl ethyl ketone along with 52 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid, which is also really important, and I will explain what it does in just a while. With this acidic paint stripper cocktail ready, I now have to prepare a solution of sodium nitrite, because I can't just use it as a powder, since then the reaction would be way too vigorous. I got 40 grams of it into a beaker and dissolved it using 140 ml of distilled water, which resulted in this pale yellow solution ready to be used for the reaction. Before pouring it into my flask, however, I first mounted all this fancy equipment onto its three necks, which consists of a thermometer, condenser and an addition funnel. The thermometer is quite self-explanatory, and the condenser serves to keep any vapors from escaping out of the flask, the addition funnel also allows me to add my nitrite solution really slowly. Now, before beginning the reaction, I had to heat everything up to around 50 degrees Celsius, so I turned on my hot plate and with vigorous stirring allowed the reaction mixture to warm up. When it got to temperature, I started slowly adding the nitrite solution, and when it came into contact with the reaction mixture, a lot of these brown gas bubbles appeared, which quickly dissolved, making the solution take on a bright yellow color. Now, in terms of the reactions going on here, first, sodium nitrite gets attacked by hydrochloric acid, producing salt and something called nitrous acid, which you can think of as a depressed relative of nitric acid, because it easily breaks down into nitrogen dioxide, which is the created brown gas. The nitrous acid attacks methyl ethyl ketone, turning it into something called methyl ethyl ketoxim, which I will refer to just as the ketoxim, since I don't really want to repeat this stupendously long name all the time. Anyway, when I added about half of the nitrite solution, the reaction mixture's color started changing from this bright yellow to green for some reason, only to later become dark brown. Some white precipitate also appeared, and I wasn't quite sure what that was, but fortunately it quickly disappeared, making the mixture clear again. To add to this reaction's weirdness, this green liquid started appearing in the condenser, and this really surprised me, since the color green in chemistry is just incredibly rare, especially when it comes to liquids. I really wasn't expecting such a straightforward reaction to have so many little quirks and color changes, and it actually kept getting weirder, with the final color being this bright orange. Anyway, when I finished adding the nitrite solution, I let this thing react for a few minutes, and then turned off the steering, which made this oily orange layer appear. I wasn't quite expecting it, but I wasn't even surprised after all the colorful shenanigans of this reaction. I figured that this layer must be my ketoxim, which apparently is hardly soluble in water. Anyway, to proceed further, I turned off the heating, and after letting the flask cool down, took this whole setup apart. Now, I could try recovering some pure product from this messy mixture, but according to the book it's not necessary, and instead of worrying about purity, I should move straight to the next, and at the same time last reaction of this project. 
to carry it out I can't use this small flask however and I have to bring out the big guns which in this case is this ginormous 2 liter round bottom boiling flask I bought a while ago and finally get to use. I mounted it on my hot plate which at this scale looks really small then I poured in the whole reaction mixture from the first step which looked like some nice and yellow pea. I now again have to prepare a solution of sodium nitrite and for that I weighed out 141 grams of it and dissolved it all in 240 milliliters of distilled water. This solution is so concentrated that the nitrite had some trouble dissolving, fortunately with some manual steering I managed to get most of it into solution and then poured everything into the reaction flask. This time the addition order is pretty much the exact opposite of the last step and I will have to dropwise add some acid to this nitrite containing reaction mix. Speaking of acid, here I don't get to use the gentle and kind hydrochloric acid but the brutal and angry sulfuric acid of which I first have to make a solution. This tames it a little and makes the whole reaction calmer. To prepare this solution I first got 340 milliliters of distilled water into a beaker and then poured in 120 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid which warmed everything up quite a bit. I now have to add this solution into my reaction flask really slowly, so I again employed an addition funnel, but this time with an additional glass tube to allow gases generated by the reaction to escape into my fume hood. To start the addition I first turned on some really strong steering to make the ketoxim into a suspension and when everything was ready I opened the funnel's valve and let small droplets of dilute sulfuric acid fall into the flask. Now speaking of the reactions going on here, the sodium nitrite reacts with sulfuric acid to produce sodium sulfate and nitrous acid, this time however the order of mixing them is reversed and made so that all the sulfuric acid gets consumed as quickly as it touches the solution. This makes it less prone to mess up the more important reaction in which all the created nitrous acid attacks the ketoxime, transforming it into my precious diacetyl, water and a metric fricton of nitrogen monoxide. This reaction is in a chemical sense way harsher than the first one requiring no heating since it heats up quite a bit by itself, you can basically think of it as throwing a bunch of depressed and angry molecules at the ketoxime which makes its nitrogen and hydrogen atoms so scared they leave making just the oxygen stay. The byproduct of all this is a bunch of nitrogen monoxide which reacts with atmospheric oxygen producing our old friend nitrogen dioxide which fills the entire apparatus making it look really funky, a ton of it also escapes through the addition funnel and doing this without a good fume hood would be a big mistake. Anyway upon adding most of the sulfuric acid the solution changed color to bright yellow and most of the orange ketoxim oil disappeared. This meant that the more water soluble diacetyl was being created which made me really happy. When I finished adding all the acid I left the solution to stir and cool down for about 2 hours. I then got it off the hot plate and now I have to leave this forbidden apple juice to ferment for about a week. That's because there is still quite a bit of unreacted starting materials present and to drive the reaction to completion it has to sit undisturbed for quite some time. When the wick was up this whole thing really looked like it fermented taking on this more refined dark orange color. It also already smelled like some nice buttery popcorn confirming that I succeeded in making at least some diacetyl. Mm. Now there was still some ketoxim oil present but I figured that everything that could react already reacted and to get my diacetyl from this thing I have to distill it off. This distillation should separate my product from most of the other junk and since diacetyl has quite a low boiling point I won't need to use any weird techniques and just a simple distillation should do the trick. Before carrying it out I had to add some anhydrous sodium sulfate to this battery mixture since it can hold on to a ton of water and makes distilling of my product way easier. I got about 200 grams of it into the flask and after shaking everything around to dissolve it I assembled this thing into a distillation apparatus. It looked quite funny because of the gigantic flask and combined with me having to glue together my only condenser which cracked under mysterious circumstances really highlighted the amateur chemistry aspect of this project. 
Anyway, to start the distillation, I turned on the heating and to make my hot plate have a chance of getting this ginormous flask to the required temperature, encased everything in aluminum foil. Fortunately, after about half an hour, some vapors started escaping into my condenser and at first I thought that this was just some water, but instead this yellow liquid started collecting in my receiving flask. At first, I thought that this must be some impurity or a byproduct, since in organic chemistry, yellow almost always means that you messed something up, but in this case, it for some reason is the color of my target product. I was really surprised when I found this out and thought that it's quite cool for a butter flavored chemical to even look like molten butter. Anyway, I continued distilling the reaction mixture, at first collecting just diacetyl, which because of its low boiling point came over before any water. At some point, however, some water also appeared, resulting in this quite cool effect in the condenser, and when there was no more diacetyl condensing, I turned off the heating and let the boiling flask cool down. Its contents were no even darker than before, and it still probably contained some residual diacetyl I could try to recover, but since I already had quite a bit, I just didn't bother. This whole distillation left me with about 50 milliliters of some intensely smelling product, it still mixed with quite a lot of water, and before measuring the yield and doing some experiments, I wanted to clean it up a little. To do that, I got it all into this cute tiny flask and added in 50 grams of anhydrous sodium sulfate, which similarly to before holds on to most of the water and makes the diacetyl far less attracted to it. You can actually see that since the upper diacetyl layer suddenly got much thicker, anyway I now have to again distill this mixture to separate my product from it and for that I set up pretty much the exact same apparatus as before. I then began heating the flask and the vapor started coming over much faster than before which was really nice. This distillation overall went really smoothly, in the end leaving me with quite a bit of really pure diacetyl. Even though the distillation stripped it of almost all water, a tiny bit of it is probably still present and to remove it once and for all, I got a spoonful of anhydrous sodium sulfate into the flask and left it to dry my product overnight. After all this, it should be bone dry, and to store it, I transferred it all into a vial. When it comes to the yield, I managed to make 13.6 grams of some nice and yellow diacetyl. This corresponds to a total yield of around 28%, which is honestly kind of trash, but it's quite similar to what they achieved in the book, so I am pretty happy I managed to successfully reproduce such an ancient procedure. Now, when it comes to the properties of my diacetyl, apart from its unusual yellow color, it is also rather flammable and volatile. It can also be detected by reacting it with a 20% sodium hydroxide solution, which quickly turns dark brown. By far, its most interesting property is its smell. It's quite difficult to describe, but if you ever had some artificially flavored popcorn, it smells almost exactly the same. Ooh, that's interesting. Our noses are also quite sensitive to it, since a tiny amount can make a whole room smell like artificial butter for days, and after this project, my lab is just saturated with it. Now, the last thing in this project I absolutely had to do was making some butter perfume, and for that I got some Everclear, which is pretty much just food grade ethanol, and dissolved a few drops of my diacetyl in it. I then got this battery solution into a sprayer bottle and labeled it appropriately. These perfumes smelled really nice as far as artificial butter goes and my desires have now been fulfilled. Anyway, this project has really been a cool one, everything about it was really unique, from me finding the procedure in a random book to all the cool color changes or the final product. In the future, I plan to make some more cool smelling compounds and try turning them into real perfume. And for now, I have to thank you all for watching this battery project. If you enjoyed it, you can like this video, share it with a friend and subscribe to my channel. If you want to further support my work and gain access to exclusive content unsuitable for YouTube, as well as having your name displayed at the end of every video, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also, as always, a gigantic thank you goes to all my amazing Patreon members for their incredible support which allows me to take on all these projects and see you guys in the next video.